Hey everybody, Trey here. Welcome back to another video. Back with another post-mortem discussion after the severe weather outbreak across the southeast yesterday, January 12th. This was an event that was not forecast to be nearly as significant uh, the days leading up to the event yesterday. But some factors started to come together and become more apparent yesterday morning uh, and eventually led to a fairly significant tornado outbreak basically centered here across the central Alabama to far western Georgia corridor. And uh, so I thought it'd be, this be, would be a really interesting event to kind of go back and do a deep dive, take a look at the meteorology behind the event, and take a look at some of the factors that did come together to turn this from a, you know, kind of run-of-the-mill sort of squall line embedded tornado damaging wind type event to one of the more significant tornado events we've seen in quite a while. As you can see here, 300 severe weather reports, 45 tornado reports across the region. So this was a very significant event uh, that definitely ramped up uh, in the several hours leading up to game time. So the most notable tornado yesterday was the uh, long track tornado that occurred from a single supercell that eventually merged with the squall line and continued to produce tornadoes as it moved into western Georgia. This was the tornado around... Uh, Greensboro, Alabama, before moving off into the Selma vicinity. This is from the Walmart in Selma, Alabama. Very large tornado there, wrapped in kind of rain, and then became quite visible as it moved uh, near the Elmore Atauga County line. Very stout tornado that turned into something uh, that looked like that. Very, very re reminiscent of tornadoes of the past, significant tornadoes of the past. This was the Henryville, Indiana. Yeah, EF4 tornado from May uh, March 2nd, 2012, and you can see the similarities in the two tornadoes there, that uh, horizontal vortex rotating around the parent circulation, very indicative of a significant to violent tornado. Again, the ratings have not come out yet, so we're going to wait and see what those show, but this was definitely a significant tornado, uh, and some of the damage pictures I've seen uh, definitely could be, um, you know, bleeding into the violent category. So very interesting event, very uh, stout tornado there from that single supercell. And this was the day two outlook. So this was the uh, afternoon outlook on January 11th. You can see just a broad slight risk area with only a 2% tornado risk. And let's go ahead and highlight some of the things they were looking at. They were looking at a fairly stable warm sector because of some pretty significant cloud cover. You can see here while instability should remain limited overall due to an incompletely modified gulf boundary layer and substantial cloud cover. So there had been some frontal intrusions into the gulf in recent weeks, and as such, the moisture return wasn't expected to be as robust as maybe it normally would be, uh, being that we were so close to the moisture source in, uh, in the southeast. Also, was expected to be quite a bit of cloud cover throughout the uh, warm sector in the morning and afternoon hours. So that was expected to temper instability and really limit the robustness of the updrafts. But take a look at our satellite here as we go into the morning hours yesterday. And you can look at the warm sector here. We are wide open, lots of sunshine out in the open warm sector that allowed in much more instability to build than what was actually expected. And we'll take a look at some soundings uh, in a second to show that uh, that was the case. So moving on here, you can see, given the antecedent stability and low-level capping inversion, again, we'll take a look at some soundings in a second, ascent near the front will likely be required to eliminate the inversion and permit storm development, which suggests a largely linear storm mode. So you know that was kind of my concern. Looking back at some of the model data here, this is the 0Z NAM from the 12th, so the evening of the 11th, the night before the event. And I just wasn't buying into a significant tornado threat here for several reasons, most of those that the SPC mentioned as well. But notice that the trough here kind of positively tilted, kind of stronger for, stronger forcing out in here. And the one thing that had caught my eye, and we'll kind of zoom in to the southeast sector here, was kind of the overall wind profile. Look how quickly this front progresses across the southeast, a very progressive front. And given such strong frontal forcing, this is your cold front here. And again, we, we can think of a cold front as kind of that wedge of cold air, very steeply sloped. Um, kind of wedge of cold air. And if that is kind of plowing southeastward here, that's going, going to initiate a lot of storms. Now, they might not be as robust because of the limited instability, 
you know, as was as was forecast. But given that the frontal forcing was going to be so strong and that the winds out ahead of this front were going to veer pretty quickly, you can see very significant veering of those winds out of the southwest. And as we know, we like to see winds typically out of the south or southeast for a significant tornado event to really increase that low-level shear. But winds were expected to really veer right out ahead of that cold front, and it seemed like frontal forcing was going to be needed to uh, get those storms to going, and as such, um, the shear vectors were oriented pretty, um, you know, it's kind of parallel to the front for most of it. And you can see some perpendicularity here with the front, but st give, I still thought given the um, progressive nature of the overall cold front and the limited instability, that this was not going to be a significant event. Maybe a, a you know strongly forced squall line with some you know embedded circulations, some damaging winds there. Um, but definitely, as we know, that did not turn out to be the case. And you can see on some of the high res models, this is the 6Z HER from about from late in the evening on the 12th. And you can see what happens here. The progression of this HER run just doesn't look all that all that potent here. You can see the main line kind of fires very solid sort of line. Not very much robustness to these updrafts. You can see some semblance of prefrontal discrete development out in here, right ahead of the line. But again, there wasn't that much resonance time with these storms out ahead of the line. They were going to be eaten up by that line and just kind of struggle with the limited instability here um, going into eastern Alabama, into Georgia. So it just didn't look like all that robust of a threat. Uh, and by the morning of the um, 12th, the threat had been upgraded pretty substantially to an enhanced risk with a 10% tornado threat out here across central Alabama into western and northwestern Georgia, along with a damaging wind threat and some hail threat uh, as well. So the tornado threat ramped up pretty quickly with this particular event. So let's dive into the meteorology behind the event. We'll start off with the 500 millibar data. First thing we notice right off the bat, ridge across the western half of the U.S. and a very strong long wave trough here out across the eastern portion of the country. And this little shortwave, more concentrated piece of this trough had kind of broken off and dug down into the southeast. Very strong flow rounding the base of this trough. And you'll notice that the axis tilts off a little bit to the right here. And that is what we call a positively tilted trough. And we've talked about this in videos past. A, we can have a positively or neutral or negatively tilted trough. Our positively tilted troughs are usually not as mature or strong as the um, neutrally or more negatively tilted troughs. Those negatively tilted troughs have much more kind of, um, you know, vorticity, much more, much stronger vorticity response, much more lift, divergence in the exit region of those troughs. And so those are often favored for significant severe weather events, but it doesn't really matter that you have a maturing trough here with this positively tilted nature to this trough. As long as you have a trough with strong, uh, you know, features associated with it, you're going to have a severe weather threat. So this wasn't too much of a concern as far as this being positively tilted. And as we go on with time, you can actually see it does take on a little bit more of a neutral or negatively tilted nature. You can see by 20Z here, so um, 2 p.m. Central Standard Time, a little bit less positive tilt to that axis of the trough and much more of a neutral tilt to that trough and even, uh, even went a little bit more neutral to negatively tilted as we went on further into the evening. So strong trough nonetheless, uh, entering the southeast at 500 millibars, plenty of difluence aloft. We can go up here to 300 millibars. Let me start the loop here. And you'll see that we have ample diffluence or divergence aloft in the uh, centered across the southeast. Winds here in northern Mississippi to Tennessee, Mississippi to Tennessee um, out of the south southwest, more westerly flow down here into su southern Alabama. So very strong diffluence aloft in this corridor. And we talk about this almost every video, that defluence aloft is the spreading of those wind vectors, spreading a part of those wind vectors with height, leads to divergence, and leads to kind of a void. And the atmosphere doesn't like to have that void, so it tries to bring up air from below to fill that void. And that's how we get large-scale rising motion for storm initiation in a given severe weather environment. So plenty of that going on. So, so actual storm development was not really a concern here. And as we went, let's go down to 850 millibars and take a look at our low-level jet uh, setup. So let me back this up a little bit. So 12Z here, you can see a couple things going on right away. Our center of the 850 millibar low up here into Illinois and Indiana. And you can see across the southeast quite a veered low-level jet here. Winds out of the southwest or even south west-southwest here across Mississippi. And generally, that's not a great thing as far as severe weather potential goes. That can do one of two things. Number one, 
it can often bring sort of this drier air back out here to, to the southwest or southwest into the region in the low levels, and that can help uh, temper the overall severe threat, perhaps making storms a little bit more outflow dominant, uh, et cetera, or capping the air mass overall. But we're still very close to the Gulf, still, still a strong uh, uh, you know, reservoir of moisture out across the Gulf where this uh, low-level jet was kind of pulling this air from. So that wasn't too much of a concern. But that can also, this kind of veered low-level jet can also diminish the low-level wind shear for tornadoes. And that was one of my concerns, as we said, the low-level winds were kind of veering out ahead of the cold front as it approached. And that kind of tends to sort of elongate and kind of straighten the hodographs, whereas we typically like to see sort of more, um, you know, southeasterly or back surface winds when those really large looping hodographs. But oftentimes this kind of low-level jet out of the southwest or west-southwest can really straighten these hodographs and limit the low-level shear. But that wasn't going to be the case. We still had a very nice-looking surface pattern to promote very strong, a very volatile wind profile. Let me go ahead and go to the surface data here. And this low-level jet would maintain itself throughout the day across the region. So here is the um, surface map here. Let me go ahead and... So this is at 12Z. Start off the day, our surface low located somewhere in southern Illinois to southern Indiana was to move off toward the northeast fairly slowly throughout the day as this trough, the upper trough kind of dug down here. And you can see as we go on with time, we do have kind of that pressure tongue extending into the southeast, indicative of that cold front. Here's our surface low center. Cold front stretching right through that pressure tongue out here into the southeast Louisiana into Mississippi. And again, that was kind of expected to kind of surge out to the southeast and really force a lot of storms given a weak instability environment. But the interesting part of this setup was that the cold front itself, the boundary of the cold front, was actually not in the initiating boundary. So let's go to our surface map here, and let's go to about 15Z. And so it's a little bit hard to pinpoint where our actual cold front is. Here you can see the winds kind of shift out in here. So here's kind of our pressure tongue. And you can see the temperatures back in here definitely um, trail off. 50s uh, and 60s here, 70s uh, and si mid-60s out here across Mississippi, with dew points back in the 30s out here, 50s and 60s across Mississippi. So the cold front at the surface was actually back out in here. But storms were firing well out ahead of that, and they were actually firing on the baroclinic zone or that temperature gradient at 700 millibars. If we look at our 700 millibar map here, you can see that little sort of kink there in the flow. That was kind of our sort of the leading edge of the baroclinic zone. And, you know, that's kind of a term beyond the scope of this video. video. Um, but this, these storms were actually firing on this little baroclinic zone out ahead of the surface cold front. Um, here at 700 millibars. So, you know, that might sound complicated. Just know that the storms were not firing on the actual surface cold front. They were firing out ahead of the main cold front. You can you could perhaps consider this a prefrontal trough, but you can see the wind shift pretty clearly here. Winds definitely go from kind of south, west southwesterly to more southwesterly or southerly down here into Alabama. So the actual sort of maybe prefrontal trough extending up to about 700 millibars slash baroclinic zone was out in here, and storms were firing on that instead of the actual cold front, which was back kind of in here. So that was one interesting development. It was expected that the actual front was going to initiate storms here, but the, the storms were firing out ahead of the main front. So perhaps that led to a little bit um, sort of weaker forcing and allowed for a more discrete mode and a longer window for, a, for discrete storms out here with this uh, environment. So storms were starting to fire out along this kind of prefrontal trough or leading baroclinic zone out ahead of the main cold front early on in the morning. We went on with time and you notice that storms are staying fairly discreet. And again, that was not quite expected given the progressive nature of the cold front and the overall orientation of the shear vectors that were forecast um, with respect to the initiating boundary. But again, because that initiating boundary may be, have led to a little bit weaker forcing, a little bit more perpendicularity to the overall um, shear vectors with respect to the initiating boundary. We'll, and we'll go back and we'll take a look at that here. So keep in mind where our initiating boundary was. We'll take a look at our zero to six kilometer shear vectors. And so, so our orientation of the kind of prefrontal trough or baroclinic zone, kind of somewhat like this, maybe a little bit more kind of like this. And here are our shear vectors, zero to six, six kilometer shear vectors. You can see a decent amount of perpendicularity 
with respect to the initiating boundary. So this was allowing for these storms to ma maintain their semi-discrete nature for quite a while, even though it, it was not forecast that, that was going to be the case. Also, a little bit less forcing to the south here with southern extent. You can see, we'll go back to our 500 millibar map and kind of take a look at that. So we are a little bit farther removed from the overall forcing here down in the southern portion of Mississippi into Alabama. So a little bit less forcing, leading all leading to a more discrete mode. And, and that, that is going to be the key with this event. The significant tornadoes are going to be produced by the discrete supercells. And the line is going to produce more of a damaging wind threat. And you can see with time what happens. We do kind of maintain a more discrete mode down to the south and kind of a more linear organization to the storms with northern extent closer to that forcing. But this was our storm of concern. This was the eventual Selma tornado producer. It was staying well out ahead of the line. And that was of significant concern. Um, because you know some of the model, most of the models were showing that 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 could happen, but it would merge with the line pretty quickly, which would kind of negate the tornado threat. But that was not happening. Also of note, these storms were firing in in kind of southeastern Mississippi here. Notice this localized area of more backed surface winds. You can see in southern Alabama, winds more out of the south southwest or southwest. Same thing up in northern Alabama, a little bit more veered surface winds out out in there. But uh, here across the kind of Tuscaloosa vicinity toward Brent and Centerville, right ahead of these developing discrete storms, including that Selma, the eventual Selma storm, little bit more backed surface winds, more winds more out of the south than the southwest. So all signs were pointing to that this these storms, because they were maintaining their discrete nature, in this volatile environment, we're going to be able to produce significant tornadoes, particularly that Selma storm, because it was staying so discrete. So let's take a look at some soundings now. And so this is the 12Z Birmingham sounding. And right off the bat, you can see this is a pretty favorable environment for severe storms. Limited instability, once again. And that was kind of, you know, going to be the case throughout the day. But given such uh, abundant sunshine that was not quite as expected out across the open warm sector, uh, that we were, we were seeing an increase in that instability. Also continued warm, moist advection at the surface, helping to bump up the instability in the low levels. And as a result... You can see low level instability right off the bat fairly strong. 66 over 61, 0 to 3 kilometer cape, all approaching 80 joules per kilogram. Fairly adequate zero, low level instability for this environment. A little bit of a capping inversion, which was you know noted by the Storm Prediction Center in their outlooks. A little bit of a, of a capping inversion, but the um, entrance of the shortwave trough into the region was helping to erode that pretty quickly. You can see by 15Z, we had nicely eroded that cap. A little bit of moistening aloft there as well a more destabilized profile, only about 600 joules per kilogram of mixed layer cape. But in these cool season events with this much shear in play, that, you know, isn't too much of an issue. Definitely more than adequate for severe storm development. You can also see here at Birmingham, nice veering winds in the low levels. You can see that on the hode graph as well. Nice clockwise curvature to the hode graph there, over 300 meters squared per second squared of effective storm relative helicity. A little bit of weirdness there in the mid-levels of the hode graph. You can see the winds back a little bit there in the mid-levels and perhaps weaken just a tad. And that's just kind of because of the orientation of the trough, a little bit of wonkiness there with how the trough was overall stacked in the vertical, how the progression of the trough was, was happening, a little bit of that positive tilt nature maybe leading, of that 500 millibar trough leading to a little bit of wonkiness there in the mid-level flow. But by 17Z, that had worked itself out quite a bit. You can see very strong low-level instability by now, approaching 100 joules per kilogram of low-level cape. That inversion had kind of uh, you know gotten rid. We kind of gotten rid of that inversion there at Birmingham. Very strong low-level instability with this kind of profile out ahead of these storms. That is going to make for a significant tornado threat, no doubt. Still, like kind of the value of mixed layer cape on the low side, only about 500 to 600 joules per kilogram. But still, very strong low-level shear, very strong low-level instability, helping to initiate a, a you know very volatile environment for these discrete supercells to move into. And so this was once again the 1637Z VWP from Birmingham showing an even more volatile environment, very strong curvature there in the low levels. Zero to one kilometer storm relative velocity of almost 500 meters squared per second squared. So this was a very volatile uh, wind profile for these semi-discrete storms uh, that were going into this environment. So you have this really volatile environment in place out ahead of these storms 
And I think this is the number one reason why that Selma, the eventual Selma storm was the significant tornado producer of the day and able to kind of overperform based on expectations. It was simply because it was discreet. You can see as we zoom out a little bit here with the radar, here is our storm of interest. You can see it's all by its lonesome out ahead of the line. And these storms also had produced some tornadoes as well as they moved into western Alabama. But the line would kind of congeal back out to the west, and this Selma storm would kind of stay all by its lonesome out ahead of the line for quite some time. And as a result, in that kind of environment of strong low-level instability, strong low-level shear, as long as you have discrete storms, you were going to see a significant tornado threat. And um, you can see behind it, the line is kind of congealing, more so a damaging wind, embedded circulation threat, whereas you have a storm all by itself in this kind of environment, you are going to see a pretty substantial, significant tornado threat, and that's exactly what we got. And even as it merged with the line, it was able to continue producing tornadoes. Here is a loop here, thanks to Peter Corman on Twitter. You can follow him there at the uh, handle right there at the bottom of the screen. But you can see here this loop, this storm just continues to chug along, goes through some mergers, goes through some behavioral changes, and finally, you know, gets into that environment into uh, with those slightly more back surface winds out ahead of it, it's very strong low level shear, and starts producing that tornado. And you can see here, it just remains steady state throughout its entire life cycle. Doesn't go through cycles, doesn't go through much change at all. And for a steady state profile, we need the right wind profile. And Cameron Nixon kind of calls this the forever mezzo. This is a um, rap sounding out ahead of this storm near uh, Centerville, Alabama. And you can see exactly what we're talking about. Wouldn't worry too much about the instability here. We, again, we're seeing adequate instability overall, about 1,000 joules per kilogram or so. Low-level instability was fairly strong, but look at this wind profile here. Extremely strong low-level shear. Some evidence of those slightly more back surface winds out here across west central to central Alabama, but extremely strong low-level shear. You can see the veering in those winds with height. But fairly weak mid-level shear. You can see a little bit of that looping in that mid-level uh, kind of hodograph. So a little bit of a little bit weaker shear aloft uh, atop very strong shear in the low levels. And that is what Cameron Nixon, you know, as we've talked about his work before, check out his website here on the storm relative hodograph. But this is called the forever mezzo. And that is characterized by very strong low level shear, very weak sort of mid-level shear. And these storms can be very compact and that's exactly what we saw with the Selma storm, you can see how small it is. It's not a very wide, not a very wide supercell or large supercell by any stretch of the imagination. But again, it's all by itself in this strong low level shear, weak mid level shear environment. And so you're gonna get a strong tornado cyclone. The supercell may be composed of entirely the tornado cyclone. And these are your kind of forever meso, quote unquote, type situations. Very strong low level shear, very weak mid level shear. And these can allow it, with the proper storm mode, which we got here, these storms to produce very strong to violent tornadoes for a long period of time without cycling. It just continues on in a very steady state uh, until something interrupts it and moves into more volatile environment. Or, you know, the, it kind of merges with the squall line. And it was expected that the, the tornado threat would uh, discontinue, would be discontinued after the storm merged with the squall line, after the squall line kind of caught up. But that's not what happened. The Tornado, the tornadic supercell merged with the squall line and continued to produce tornadoes as it moved off toward the northeast in kind of a bookend vortex fashion. If we zoom back out here to our reflectivity, we go on with time. Let me kind of see. Yeah, here we go. So it continues to move on with time. You can see our Selma storm right in there. Eventually merges with the line, and you can see what happens here. This portion of the squall line kind of bows out, creates a bow echo. And, and when that happens, you can often get these bookend vortices on the northern edge of the bow echo. And this was this bow echo, or this uh, bookend vortex was created by this tornadic supercell as it merged with the line. And it continued to produce tornadoes in this very volatile environment as it moved off into western Georgia. Now, one thing of note as well, you'll notice that the storms down here continue to stay discrete. We had this particular supercell across southern Alabama that was also in a favorable environment, seemingly for tornadoes. But this storm in particular was kind of struggling with um, persistent uh, rear flank downdraft surges and kind of outflow dominance throughout its life cycle. You can see here, you can even see the reflectivity um, portion here with that rear flank downdraft gust front. And you can see it even more so here. 
here's your supercell, here's the hook echo, here's your rear flank, gust front right there. So the rear flank downdraft was kind of surging out at times. The low level rotation would try to tighten, it would surge out, undercut it, and that cycle would go on for quite a while. Eventually we did get a tornado to produce uh, here in far south um, southeast Alabama. But given a dis discrete storm mode, you'd think that you'd get a significant long track tornado out of this as well. Well, that wasn't the case exactly. Let's go back to our soundings here. And let me actually go to the four panel view here. So this was our storm as it was moving through south uh, east Alabama. You can see tight rotation. You can actually see the rear flank gust front out ahead of the couplet. So you can see it's trying to tighten its low level rotation, but the rear flank gust front was still surging out ahead of it. This boundary between the bright greens and the, the lighter, the darker greens out in here. That, that was your rear flank gust front surging out ahead of the main velocity couplet as it continued off toward the east. So it was kind of struggling with that throughout its entire life cycle. And you, you would think, even though it does eventually produce the tornado here, you can see the debris signature there out just west of Blue Springs before it kind of gusts out again as it moves east of the Blue Springs area. There's that rear flank gust front right in there. But you'd think again that this would be one of another significant tornado producer. But let's take a look at our soundings here. And that kind of holds the key why that central Alabama area was just kind of in that sweet spot for our, you know, perfect sort of long track tornado threat. So here's our Brent Centerville wrap sounding, proximity sounding. You can see that hodograph, very, very large hodograph. Very nice looking thermodynamic profile as well. Now let's go down to 20Z at Ozark, Alabama in proximity to that storm. Couple differences we note right away. So here, lots of dry air aloft at this location down in Southern Alabama. And that perhaps was getting translated to the surface and that drier air aloft tends to uh, promote stronger downdrafts and perhaps that was a contributing factor to our rear flank downdraft being a little bit stronger and therefore undercutting the mesocyclonic circulations there that that storm in southern Alabama was trying to build. Very deep moist layer though, you can see it near the surface, but I think in a little bit stronger instability, uh, being kind of closer to the moisture source, over about 1300 joules per kilogram there. Still strong low level instability, so that wasn't a problem, but I think this drier air aloft was kind of getting entrained into the downdraft there and perhaps strengthening those rear flank downdraft surges and undercutting the mesocyclone. Also, not quite as favorable of a low-level shear profile. Definitely a deep layer shear profile, profile favorable for supercells and discrete supercells at that. But notice the low-level winds a little bit more veered here. Not nearly as much veering of those winds in the low levels. You can, as we recall, our Brent Centerville sounding ahead of that Selma storm, very, very favorable, very strong low-level shear. But down here, not quite as much. You can see those winds kind of focus on the wind barbs here. Very strong veering with this Brent Centerville sounding not nearly as much here in southern Alabama. So that corridor in central Alabama ahead of that um, Selma storm was definitely the most favorable for long track supercells so long as they would make, so they would stay discrete. And even even though they um, the Selma storm merged with the line, it still produced tornadoes because that environment was just kind of right in the sweet spot there in central Alabama. So that kind of does it. I, a pretty simple explanation here. Um, you have a very volatile uh, environment in place, uh, as we saw, very strong uh, low-level instability, very strong, um, you know, adequate deep layer instability, very strong low-level instability. Let me go to the Birmingham sounding here, but a very strong looking wind profile for significant tornadoes here. 400 meters squared per second squared of storm relative velocity. Any discrete right moving supercell in that environment was going to produce have the chance to produce significant long track tornadoes. We just needed discrete storms. And even though the forecast didn't quite show that discrete storms were gonna be a possibility, we did get this discrete storm to fire out ahead of the main line and stay ahead of the main line for quite a while, uh, producing a long track tornado here. And then even after it merged with the line, it was able to produce tornadoes in kind of that bookend vortex fashion, given such strong low level shear uh, um, oriented properly with respect to the line. One additional note about the Selma Tornadic Supercell was that it had a very interesting display of debris on the correlation coefficient product on radar. If you're not familiar with correlation coefficient or CC, it basically tells us how similar uh, the particles are that the radar is seeing. So for example, if a radar is, is um, probing a storm and it's seeing all raindrops, then the correlation coefficient is going to be very high because those particles are very, very similar or correlated to one another. But if you have pieces of boards, bricks, nails, houses, trees, 
mixing in with that precipitation, i.e. tornado debris mixing in with that rain and hail, then your correlation coefficient is going to be much lower where your tornadic vo tornado vortex signature is. And that is how we can confirm whether or not there is a tornado in progress based on radar alone. So in this case, this is the correlation coefficient product, pr product from the Selma supercell. And you can see right here as it it moves into Selma, very tight low area of lowered correlation coefficient here, extending uh, over two miles wide at some times. So that was indicative of a very strong tornado in progress there. Moves off toward the northeast, and you see this kind of shedding of these this area of lowered correlation coefficient. Here's our tornado debris signature, and here's this very large area of correlation coefficient here. This is actually debris fallout. So this you know, debris signature, debris was being lofted to above about 22,000 feet, which based on some research, it, uh, some peer reviewed research is, is um, based on some research is indicative of um, a very strong tornado, likely high end EF3 or greater. But it was picking up all this debris and fanning it out up, up uh, downstream and letting it fall out here. And this is all the fallout you see on radar. So pretty incredible um, uh, radar imagery here of all this debris that's being that's falling out of the storm from this strong tornado that was ongoing with the Selma supercell. A couple more quick notes here. We let me go back to the satellite here. We had continuation. We had, you know, that band out ahead of the main line here across southeastern Alabama into southwestern Georgia out on that prefrontal confluence band. We also had storms fire back out in here well behind the main front. I believe these were kind of on the actual cold front that was moving to the southeast. And if we go to our surface temperature, wind, and dew point data, you can see the dew points, the moisture kind of forming kind of a tongue back in there across northern Alabama, leading up into kind of the, the sort of that cold front region. Here's your actual cold front right along this boundary, right along the pressure tongue. A little bit of moisture uh, kind of pooling up in there across northern Alabama. This was, you know, somewhat reminiscent to kind of a cold core type setup. Let me zoom back out to the full conus sector here. And you'll see as that 500 millibar trough moves in, we set the loop options here. As that 500 millibar trough moves in, we start to see kind of that somewhat pseudo sort of cold core characteristics. You can see the cold air aloft associated with this system, you know, minus 22, minus 24 degrees here at the center of the trough, that cold air moving into northern Alabama. And as a result, we were kind of getting such kind of a somewhat of a cold core type scenario. Moisture kind of pooling up out ahead. There may have even been a little bit of some a semblance of a surface low in there. You can see a little bit tighter of maybe a circulation right developing here in northern Alabama. So maybe a somewhat of a small sort of meso low developing along the cold front, helping to kind of focus that little bit of moisture there up into north, northern and northeast Alabama. We did have a couple tornado warnings within these storms here, but definitely a, a somewhat of a, a kind of pseudo cold core type event as that moisture tongue was kind of leading up into maybe the sort of mesolo along the front uh, and as that cold air aloft moved in. And that helped to initiate some more storms down there out behind the main band of storms out there across northern uh, Alabama that did produce some tornado warnings uh, up in there. So very interesting evolution with this event, no question. And again, I think the answer is simple. Very volatile environment for severe storms, significant tornado producers perhaps. All you needed was the storm mode to be proper, and then you were going to get a long track kind of supercell, a tornadic supercell event. That's exactly what we got, especially out across central Alabama. Once again, a little bit more backed winds out ahead of those storms in central Alabama. A little bit better moisture aloft there. We saw in southern Alabama a little bit of dry air and training into those updrafts, perhaps increasing the outflow production with those storms. Uh, and even uh, and so those as long as storms were going to stay discrete here in this kind of sweet spot in central Alabama, which they did for quite a while, they were going to produce some significant tornadoes. And, and no doubt we got a significant to violent tornado out of this. will be interesting to see what this tornado was rated here from the Selma supercell. Looks like your classic violent super, violent tornado with the horizontal vortex. We've seen it time and time again with significant to violent tornadoes. will be interesting to see what the ratings for that tornado are. But 
very interesting event, very uh, an event that definitely overperformed. And actually, the entire event itself, kind of you know, outside of that Central Alabama corridor, kind of was ex as expected. Not a ton of tornado reports, a few tornado reports here and there, but mostly a damaging wind threat with mainly that squall line there. But that Central Alabama corridor, because that was able to be discrete, that storm was able to maintain its discrete nature for quite a while in just a little bit more volatile environment, uh, more back surface winds out ahead of it. That was your answer, I think, why this uh, that portion of central Alabama into western Georgia was your preferred corridor for long-track tornado potential with yesterday's event. So that's going to do it. Thanks for watching. We'll see you in the next video.